Sir Ebert appealed to the workers to help. So the urban workers caused, or called a strike and asked people or, or refused to cooperate with the leaders of the coup. So this general strike basically shut down the entire country. So order was soon restored. So as you can see, the threats from the left and the right sort of alienated people on both sides. To make matters worse, the legal system, the previous legal system, remained intact. And judges and lawyers had loyalty to the old regime. The result of this is that they tended to be much more lenient on those accused of sort of attacking, attacking the republic um, from the right. So they were more lenient on the right. Whereas those who had attempted to destabilize the republic from the left were actually given death penalties. The leaders of the Kapuch, very lenient. This was the same situation in terms of um, the uh, the, the, sort of the wave of sub, sub, um, subsequent assassinations, or at least attempted assassinations. Those from the right often were released or received short sentences. Matthias Erzberger, leader of the Catholic Center Party, the group that signed the Versailles Treaty, was murdered by nationalists, right-wing nationalists, in August 1921. In addition, Foreign Minister Walter Rathenau, who had tried to negotiate a compromise and reparation settlement, was gunned down by a group of right-wing nationalist assassins who considered him to be a traitor to Germany. This is in 1922. Rathenau is also Jewish. Now, Walter Rathenau was actually something of a hero in World War I. He served very successfully um, he was in charge of armaments and um, increasing wartime production. When he was appointed foreign minister, this was a huge, huge step forward for Jewish Germans because he was the first to hold this type of position in Germany. His assassins, however, and many of the attackers on the right were vicious, and he'd actually been threatened um, many times before. There was a slogan that was very popular in right-wing bars, which went, shoot down that Walter Rathenau, that cursed goddamn Jewish sow. While workers and supporters of the, of the Republic protested in the street, Rathenau's killers became heroes to those on the right. And the longest sentence that one of the assassins got was seven years. So. There were also foreign policy challenges in the post-war years for Weimar. We talked about how the leaders were blamed for many aspects, or from many aspects of the population for saddling Germany with the Weimar, uh, the Treaty of the Versailles. And it was the perception of the treaty being harsh, not the reality that provided sort of grist for political manipulations. It was very easy to have a cognitive gap that, um, that made Germans believe that they hadn't lost the war. This meant that those who were sort of leading the, guy, the Weimar Republic in these years were, con were considered traitors or accused of selling out. There were actually massive propaganda efforts within Germany um, and outside of Germany against the treaty. The actual Weimar government engaged in these propaganda efforts as well. Because the Foreign Office set up this, um, this sort of special division to investigate the so-called war guilt uh, clause by hiring professional historians um, to look at the documents and collect documents and write a report that sort of outlined how Germany was not responsible for World War I. We already talked about the fact that the Versailles Treaty didn't assign moral guilt to Germany. One element of the campaign I also highlighted was the anxiety um, in, the, uh, in Germany over the use of colonial troops to sort of uh, govern the Rhineland. And the Germans were very successful in conveying this to British and Americans 
that they were being unjustly punished. The use of African troops was a manifestation of this injustice. Newspaper accounts, plays, and rumors, and horror stories actually ended up stirring up hatred against the French and won the sympathy for Germans abroad. Both of these sort of um, uh, elements of propaganda were very successful. So the old grievances were kept alive in schools and churches and political speeches. It's still a common misconception today. But meanwhile, the reparations were constantly revised downward for Germany. Germany received massive loans. And there was huge investment in the country. Weimar um, is often depicted as a period of economic chaos that led directly to the rise of Hitler. There were economic troubles, but the idea of, of economic chaos leading to Hitler is, is, is too much of an exaggeration. Germany was actually relatively prosperous. They had an intact infrastructure. The economies of their neighbors were weak and relied on German products. And actually, the bread ration in Britain lasted longer than it did in Germany. After the war, the German mark did plunge significantly. And in 1923, there was a period of hyperinflation. Merriman includes a lot of details in the text on this. So you have descriptions of Germans who had to wheel shopping carts or baby carriages sort of full of money um, just to purchase something simple like tobacco. At its worst point, it cost trillions of marks in order to purchase bread. And this is all true. But we need to put it in context as well. Inflation was very, very common in post-war Europe. And there, were even hype, there was even hyperinflation outside of Germany itself. Most importantly, the inflation wasn't caused by the reparations. Rather, the Germans had financed the war by getting loans, and to try to pay these off, they ended up printing more and more money. In addition, in order to make their reparations um, to the French and the British worthless, they deliberately undermined their own currency. So, Germany wanted to allow for some inflation, but this spiraled out of control and spiraled into hyperinflation in 1923. But you can't connect this to the rise of Hitler, because there's 10 years between his, this event and Hitler's coming to power. In addition, once the Germans reached understanding with, French, with the French about the reparations, the inflation was brought quite quickly under control. The second thing that's important to note is that contrary to the idea that the German middle class was com like collectively ruined by this inflation um, and made Hitler or made them right for Hitler, is also more complicated. In any inflation, of course, there are winners and there are losers. In Germany at this time, people who were on a fixed income or had small savings were certainly losers. And inflation did wipe many, many families out financially. And it led to desperation, and homelessness, and hunger. But there were also winners. For instance, people who owned property, farmers, or those who could pay off huge bank loans with this crazy sort of inflated currency. So, Amongst the rich, some were able to actually improve their circumstances. I should say the rich or the, uh, I don't know that entrepreneurial is the right term, but um, those who could take advantage of the situation. So it's not as simple to say that there was just a economic chaos, but the image of losers and homelessness and um, is much stronger than the image of winners and increasing wealth. What is important is that the inflation did have a destabilizing effect. 
because it made people unsure about the future. It deepened this sort of perception of disorder and the possibility of enduring loss. But by the mid-1920s, many of these problems had actually settled down, and there was a period of relative stability. So the image of a chaotic Weimar Republic through the whole time period doesn't hold. There were also some foreign policy, some very important foreign policy successes during the stable years. In 1925, the German government signed the Treaty of Locarno. It's actually five treaties. But basically, it guaranteed Germany's western borders as settled at the end of the war. So Germany renounced claims to Alsace-Lorraine. This obviously improved relations with France. So there was a concept of the spirit of Locarno, which referred to the mood of increasing international cooperation. In 1926, Germany was permitted to join the League of Nations. Now, these foreign policy successes were negotiated and presided over by a very preeminent statesman, Gustav Stresemann. And Stresemann himself was quite an interesting character. He wasn't actually a staunch supporter of the Weimar Republic, but he was pragmatic. He saw the need to work together with the Social Democrats and also with the country's former enemies, France, Soviet Union, to improve Germany's situation. He did dream of restoring Germany's borders, particularly its uh, pre-war borders in the East. But he thought it was better to do so through the existing structures. In Stresemann's opinion, the best way to gain Germany's sort of interest was through a policy of statesmanship rather than aggression. He was hated on the right and considered a, true, a, a traitor to the true interests of Germany, even though he himself, as I said, wasn't um, a, a supporter of, of Weimar. Nevertheless, his death in 1929 is often seen as the end of the period of stability in Germany. I want to talk a little bit about Weimar culture, because it was a very active and dynamic life. We saw a clip of this Nazi idea of culture and how it reacted to the avant-garde experimentation in Weimar. Berlin became the hub of progressive, exciting cultural developments. There are many examples. I'm going to highlight two. First of all, the film industry increased in importance in Germany. Many, many incredible films produced in Germany in the 1920s and 30s. Last week, we saw a famous, uh, famous film, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. One of the most famous films of the period it's called The Blue Angel. It starred Marlene Dietrich. It was, 19, it was produced in 1930. It was based on a story by Heinrich Mann, who's actually Thomas Mann's brother. And Heinrich Mann was a left-wing writer. And The Blue Angel was a scathing critique of middle-class culture. Marlene Dietrich actually left Germany to make a career in Hollywood. She was invited back by the Nazis, but she refused. So the Germans were considered to be something of risk takers in cultural expression during this time period. There are also developments in architecture and crafts. The Bauhaus was an experimental German art school founded by the architect Walter Gropius in Weimar in 1919. And it moved to Dessau in 1925. And this group sought sort of uh, ways, practical ways to transform and improve society through art. It was a group of artists and architects and craftspeople, men and women, that believed that form follows function and that one could use art to enhance life. So this group tried to bring good industrial design to everyday objects houses, furniture, even utensils. 
They believed in something called social art, whose combination of beauty and practicality would restore sort of the wholeness of, to everyday life. They developed styles that are still considered modern and actually influenced buildings in North America. And it's still a very popular style. However, this period of stability also saw a shift in a conservative direction politically. When we think about the governing coalitions, and, and Weimar was often governed by coalitions, most of the time people think of the dominant political party as being the Social Democrats. But actually, by, this wasn't true by the, by the sort of the stable period. After a few years, the socialists were actually almost completely shut out of the government. And it was the parties, the center parties, and to the right, the conservatives, that formed most of the Weimar coalitions. When Friedrich Ebert died in 1925, he was replaced by Hindenburg. This is a, a troubling point, a turning point in Germany, because Hindenburg was no friend of democracy. As we know, he was one of the individuals who invented the stab in the back explanation for the lost war. And that accusation was in itself deeply anti-democratic. It, it sort of um, argued that the, the enemies of Germany were precisely the founders of the Republic. And Hindenburg, as president, was in a key position. So it was basically like having a fox guard the hen house. Still, through the end of the 1920s, Weimar did continue to function as a multi-party system. But one feature of this period was the emergence of sort of uh, uh, splinter parties, particularly right-wing but fringe political parties, one of which was the National Socialist Democratic German Work or the National Socialist German Workers' Party, the Nazis. It was founded in 1920, and soon Adolf Hitler took over the leadership. But at this period, it's just a whole, it's just one of a whole host of parties on the right and the left. And it was really just a, a blip on the Weimar political scene until 1929. We think back to Mussolini, who was in power in 1922, and Stalin, who was on his way up. Hitler was a nobody in 1922. So his chronology is quite different from Mussolini and Stalin and can serve as a reminder of the stability of the Weimar Republic at this point. So the question becomes, how did Hitler come to power? He wasn't a particularly remarkable person. His father was a minor civil servant. His mother was a housewife. He wasn't distinguished as a child. His family wasn't poor. And when his father died, he left Hitler a trust fund um, that allowed him to live in Linz, in Vienna, painting and sketching, and indulging in his, uh, his love of Richard Wagner's operas. Like Mussolini, Hitler would later make much of his impoverished youth and also his military career. But these are both exaggerations. There are many uh, sort of rumors that developed about Hitler that he was part Jewish, he was not, that he was homosexual, or latent or secret homosexual, there's no evidence for this, and even that he was impotent, same, there's no evidence. But these were all efforts to sort of explain, to sort of explain the gap, to explain this radical evil. But when you think about it, what would such rumors explain even if they were true? In the early part of his career, the Nazi party was small, and Hitler was just a rabble-rouser. But he did have support from an important individual, General Ludendorff from World War I. In November 1923, Hitler and a group of conspirators launched the putsch known as the Beer Hall Putsch, in which they tried to overthrow the government of Bavaria, and hoped to take over Germany. In 
On the 9th of November, Hitler and Ludendorff led a march on government buildings, but there was really no groundswell of public support. Instead, they were quickly arrested and brought to trial. Hitler was able to use this moment, though, in court to present himself on the national stage, so it actually gave him a stage. He declared that he wanted to be the destroyer of Marxism. He received only a short prison sentence. He served less than a year. But it was during this time that he wrote Mein Kampf, which was sort of his world outlook. So the failure of the putsch, in some ways, advanced him from a minor figure of only regional interest to someone who was known on the national stage. Hitler certainly had a skill for public speaking, for organizing, and for channeling the desires of his audience. But his own worldview didn't really change. Mussolini, of course, ad advocated action, but we saw how his political views changed. Hitler's remained the same, especially when it was concerned with this idea, you could think of it as race and space. So he had this belief in so-called Aryan supremacy, and he was concerned especially with Jews, with people with disabilities, African Germans, Poles, and Russians. And this related to his idea of Lebensraum, or living space in the East. So it's a social Darwinist idea that um, a struggle to survive, you kill or be killed. And these obsessions were very, very important to Hitler throughout his entire regime, but he showed considerable flexibility in working towards them. So Hitler was always very mindful of public opinion. And that's something important to keep in mind as we talk about the triumph of the right and the wars of the Holocaust. What I want to leave you with today is that the Weimar Republic was vital and it was stable despite the range of difficulties. From 1923, it was functioning as a democracy, and it had a fairly strong economy in contrast to many parts of Europe. So on Thursday, we'll look at how that shattered, and we'll look at the triumph of the right in Europe in general, Germany, and the Spanish Civil War. Have a great afternoon.